devastation caused by tornadoes raises some ethical questions and gives us an opportunity to discuss and learn something together, namely how building codes are made and how regulations interact between businesses, employers, and employees. So the first question that I think we want to look at briefly is, you know, should tornado alley states have stricter tornado codes? Um, in other words, should they have stricter building codes? Should they have stricter business regulation codes? Um, and, and, and that. The other thing, though, we want to talk about uh, talking about feasibility is, you know, certain businesses, should they be required to have safe rooms or safer rooms? Um, like if you look at the situation, you read some of the articles regarding uh, what happened at um, the Amazon factory, for example, um, they were saying that people were huddled into bathrooms and they were told to go into, into particular bathrooms because they were considered safe spaces or safe rooms. Um, but then there was loss of life there and those bathrooms were completely destroyed. And so the question is, is should, should businesses be required to create safe rooms and, and the, this type of thing? But in order to understand this and, and really be able to answer these questions, I thought it would be really helpful if we kind of discussed a little bit about tornadoes which makes them unique amongst uh, disasters uh, around the world. So for comparison's sake, we're going to talk about comparing hurricanes to tornadoes. We could have compared earthquakes to tornadoes, floods to tornadoes, any other natural disaster. But but this, I think, is very help, helpful visually. On the left, you can see in the big blue circle, you see Hurricane Sandy. And this is for size comparison compared to the tri-state tornado that occurred uh, several years ago. Okay. And I circled it in red because the dot is so tiny, you may not actually see it. So clearly the Hurricane Sandy is much larger than the Tri-State Tornado. Now, tornadoes have a higher wind speed than hurricanes, but hurricanes can still cause massive damage even though they have lower wind speeds. Tornadoes can also cause massive damage. But when we're talking about damage, we're talking about scale, right? And, and so I think it's, it's important to understand the scale between these two storms. So as these storms pass over an area of land, you can see the swath of destruction as the hurricane moves in this direction compared to the swath of destruction that the tornado causes as it moves in its path of destruction. Hurricanes also tend to last longer, um, and, and so there's a lot of other factors with that. Hurricanes can also bring in uh, uh, flooding and, and other devastation, and you'll see why all this matters in a bit. So this brings up some and this is sort of that was sort of background fodder for understanding how you design a building code and really how you design honestly a regulation uh, if we're going to be talking about any sorts of regulations dealing with uh, uh illinois and the states affected by the tornadoes uh and and what they should do th this th that's all background and and what's really important is to understand how these codes get put together so one of the most important terms we can study uh, in this video is what's called the return period. And then the second most important topic is going to be engineering limitations. And then the third item is going to be the value of statistical life. All right. And uh, this is a very key term. This isn't a, a phrase I made up, the value of a statistical life. Uh, it's, it's referred to as the VSL value, and it's used by government agencies all over the world to determine regulations and laws and codes, building codes, all sorts of things. All right, but let's tackle the return period first. What is the return period? So the return period is essentially the statistical likelihood that an event caused, let's say, by a natural disaster will occur at the same location more than once uh, in a given period of time. So if you've ever heard of hurricanes or storms being referred to as a 25 year storm or a 100 year storm, it doesn't mean that the storm comes every 100 years. What it means is that you have in any given year, a 1% chance of that storm occurring. Well, in the case of a tornado and in the tornado alley states, they have a lot of tornadoes. They have a high volume of tornadoes each year. I mean, we're talking a lot of tornadoes, but they don't tend to land in the same exact place uh, uh, each time that they land. So here's a picture here of, of a tornado um, that has cut a swath through the town, right? And you can see in the middle of the town the devastation that the, the tornado has caused, and you can almost map out its path, if you will. But then right outside of that path, you can see buildings and structures, you know, not 100 uh, meters away, that are in 
what appear to be visually fine condition. They're still standing. They still have their roofing on them. Um, and so that's the very unique thing about tornadoes is they're very tight. It's almost like if if a if a hurricane was like a Mack truck coming through a town or a city or or a state rather, um, the the tornado is like a scalpel cutting a very fine line. And so statistically, the question then becomes, well, this house here at this lot was destroyed. Okay, and I'll kind of shade that in. Well, the question then becomes, what is the statistical likelihood that that lot that location will see another hurricane again. And that's, and you start thinking, okay, well, there may be another hurricane in the future, but it may hit over here. And it may cause massive devastation to, to this part of the land, but it didn't hit this subject property. And so this is where we start talking about return period. What is the time period in which this devastating um, natural disaster will return to this particular location or this exact location? Here's another picture showing um, the hurricane dam or tornado damage rather right next to a mobile home park. And as you, if you know anything about mobile homes, they're not typically rated for very strong wind uh, resistance. And so here you can see the path that, it, that, that the tornado took. And it actually, you can actually map out and see that it took a jog here. So it was going this way and then it jogged over and then it jogged up, which I find really interesting with these, with these photos about tornadoes. But you can see that the mobile homes literally right next to the path, I mean, they still have all their roofing on. They're still uh, upright. You can actually see these sheds um, next to these buildings that I circled here that are still standing. I mean, these sheds aren't held down by really much at all. And so this kind of shows you just how scalpel-like tornado damage can be. It's devastating if you're in the path and, and, and if, it, and if it, uh, it destroys your building or the building you're in or the home you own. I understand that's extremely devastating. But when we're talking as far as building codes and government regulations and things, we have to start thinking in terms of this return period. The second item that we need to really think about when we're discussing, okay, what can we do to prevent this from happening again or to at least prevent the loss of life, right? Well, there are actual real engineering limitations. You know, whereas hurricanes can tend to get from 120-ish to 150-ish miles an hour for most of them, um, we rarely ever see it make landfall over 150 miles an hour. That's very, very rare. But in a tornado, they can oftentimes reach speeds well over 200 miles an hour. And when you, st when you start dealing with wind speeds that high, there's not a lot engineering wise you can do. Here is a picture of where a tornado passed over this town and you can see that it actually stripped the asphalt right off of the road. Okay, this is something you don't see with hurricanes. Here's another picture of a house wiped completely clean down to its foundations to the point where it actually peeled all the carpet up out of the house. I mean, there's literally nothing left of this house except the slab and foundation that it's sitting on. Now, in an individual home, they ha they do have success building safe rooms, okay? So this is a safe room that it looks like it was installed in somebody's garage, uh, maybe their pantry. The whole house is gone. You can see that the house uh, uh, behind it here is gone but the safe room is still standing. So if there was anybody in that safe room, they would they would be safe. Now you can go on, on the internet and find tons of pictures of these safe rooms standing. It's the only thing standing sometimes on the foundation. But when we're talking about what happened at the candle factory and we're talking about what happened at the Amazon uh, factory or, or a, a shipping plant, then what we're really talking about is large volumes of people. How do you build and scale this structure to be bigger? And is that even cost effective to do? Then the third item that, that gets determined uh, and, and becomes a very important part to, to, uh, to whether a new law or code or regulation gets put into place is what we call the value of a statistical life, or sh for short, it's a VSL. Now, the definition of this is the local trade-off rate between fatality risk and cost. And so in America, we have set uh, this, this um, uh, value, or we didn't really set it, it's sort of been calculated to be around $10 million uh, per life. And essentially what this is, is it's a benefit to cost analysis. So if we look at any sort of uh, a hurricane, or we look at um, a flooding, or we look at earthquake uh, devastation, or we look at tornadoes, and we look at fatalities caused by any of these things, the question becomes how much 
is the local public of that area that's affected by this. So if you're if you live in an area prone to earthquakes, you, you, we're only talking about those people. Or if you're an air, person who lives in an area prone to hurricanes or tornadoes, right? And so the question becomes, how much is the average person in that area? And they poll these people and they find out through uh, scientific studies, right? What would what is somebody willing to pay in order to reduce their risk of mortality by some percentage? So let's say the question is, uh, would you be willing to pay one hundred dollars to decrease your risk of death by point zero zero one percent, right? And if you say, whoa, that's a really low percentage, I don't know, I'd rather keep my hundred dollars. You can see how quickly this becomes essentially a, a, a benefit and cost analysis, right? And so what they do is they pull people and they figure out what are people willing to pay. And so this value sort of gets quantified to be roughly, you know, $10 million per life. And how that works isn't what each individual, what you and I would be willing to pay, but it's what the group in that area would be willing to pay. So if a new regulation needs to come in and that regulation needs to say, okay, uh, we're going to, we're going to make a new rule, a new law. Businesses now have to implement um, these these uh, uh, um, large, massive safe rooms that are just built to the built to the T uh, and engineer over engineered, right? Uh, to resist tornadoes, and uh, and we're going to have advanced calling systems and all these things in place, and um, and this is going to cost hundreds of millions of dollars for businesses all in that town or in that area or in that state, um, and it's going to save three lives a year. It's, it's, they do the quick math and they say, whoa, if that exceeds $10 million per life. That's, that's not a good regulation to have. So the VSL is sort of this way to rein in governments around the world to say, okay, this doesn't make sense. This regulation doesn't make sense. It's going to be too cost prohibitive on the public to implement this uh, um, this new code, new law, new whatever you're, you're contemplating. So to kind of put things in perspective, in Illinois, uh, I pulled up um, some years. We've got uh, 2013, 2014, all the way up to 2017. And this may be a little small, but I'll just kind of par uh, you know quickly uh, um, um, summarize each of these years. So in 2013, there were 71 tornadoes, right? But there were only eight deaths. Now, every death is important. I'm not discrediting that. But when we're talking statistics and we're talking mortality statistics, um, we have to sort of have a... a um, a, a, a cold view on this, right? So uh, in 2014, we have 34 tornadoes, zero deaths. Uh, 2015, 83 tornadoes, two deaths. Uh, two, uh, 2016, we have 48 tornadoes, zero deaths. And in 2017, we had 59 tornadoes in Illinois and we had one death. So this is just one state. But you can see where if you're going to make a law and you've got a, a time period here spanning five years with a total of 11 deaths. So you've got 11 mortalities um, over five years. Okay, you can see that if there's a regulation that, that would save one life per year, but that regulation is likely to cost the general public in that area and businesses more than 10 million uh, uh, per year, that it's not going to get implemented. And so this sort of, you know, brings us full circle to, to, you know, what should businesses do? What should government regulators do? Because right now I know reading the news, there are um, uh, governors, uh, I think the governor of Illinois, if I recall correctly, is contemplating, you know, should we have new building codes? Well, going back to what I talked about engineering practicality, when you're talking tornadoes, if you're in the path of a tornado, there's very little you can do to save the entire structure. There's, there's that would be so cost prohibitive, prohibitive that it's not going to get done. Um, in Florida, it's very cost prohibitive to do the engineering that we already do for hurricanes. You know, buildings are extremely strong and robust, but hurricanes have a much higher return rate. Um, I know I've I've lived in an area in Florida where I have literally had at least three hurricanes over my lifetime pass right over the house that I've been living in. So yes, there's a much higher return period. People living in the tornado states, tornado alley, they have there are many people that have lived their entire lives and never seen one tornado damage their building or devastate you know their business or anything like that. So these are sort of the, 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 they tie into the ethical questions, right? What can be done? What can businesses do 
uh, to help protect their employees. There are real things that can be done. Um, I know there's a lot, of, and you'll see this come up in lawsuits, I'm sure, uh, here over the next couple months. Um, there will be lawsuits against Amazon, for example. And they're going to make claims that Amazon should have done more. And that may be true. I'm not going to touch on, again, uh, relationships between the employer and employee, whether they should have been notified, whether they should have been allowed to have cell phones or not, or and any of that stuff. But the question uh, I want to try to focus on is in the construction and engineering profession and in government regulation and lawmaking. And the question really is, is what, not what can be done, but what should be done if anything. Well, thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed this video.